Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back again to the PMF IS Current Affairs Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this video is about the second test that was conducted on 15th of February and this is your part number 3. Next 20 questions will be discussed in today's video along with their explanations and also we'll discuss the approach and how you are going to handle such kind of questions in your upcoming prelims exam. So I hope you have enjoyed the first two parts and I'm very sure you will find this part also very very informative and useful. Let us get started. The very first question, the question 41 was with respect to the concept of theaterization. Now this is a very interesting concept of theaterization which we use with respect to our defense services. Now there are two important things. One statement was with respect to theaterization and second was asked about the chief of the defense staff because both these are very much in the news recently and CDS is something that we have recently created in our uh, in our defense uh, hierarchy that makes very much obvious that these two concepts are to be discussed. Before we get back what was there in the question first you need to be very much comfortable with these two concepts. Well where the word theaterization it actually means it's a concept where we want to integrate the three most important armed forces in India that is the Army, Navy and Air Force. It's a concept to integrate Army, Navy and Indian Air Force so that we can optimally use their resources in any kind of war and operations. This is basically a theatre and for that purpose a theatre command or a theatre unit is created with the, uh, with the integration of these three. In India we have such kind of uh, uh, such kind of commands or the units we have in Andaman Nicobar command we have the defense space agency and also the national defense academy well these three are you can say they are the they are the examples where this theaterization has actually been done as a concept uh, and that is something which we have already in place now the second one was very important with respect to the chief of defense staff cds is something that we have recently created in our defense hierarchy it's a it is the CDS is going to be a four star officer and that person the CDS is going to head the department of the military affairs. By the way, this is the latest and very new uh, department that we have created and this CDS is going to be the principal advi military advisor of the defense minister as well as the prime minister of India and whosoever becomes the CDS now is going to be a permanent chairman of the chief of staff committee which is a committee where the chief of the three services the army navy and air force are there so it is like you have the three armed chiefs and on the top of them you have the cds and the cds is going to report directly and going to advise to the defense minister and prime minister this is what hierarchy we have we have got recently in place and the question was also with respect to these two concepts now if you look at the concept and here be very careful the question was not asking you to figure out the correct one it's about which one is not correct the first statement says theaterization concept of the navy is it about the navy only no it is not just the navy integrating its naval capability theaterization is a broad concept integration of the three army air force and navy so this technically is wrong second says cds is the officer headed uh, head of the department of military affair yes Principal military advisor of defense minister, yes, defense minister and also the prime minister. But, but, but if the question would have been defense minister only, then this statement would be wrong. Now, there is nothing mentioned. So, yeah, this is also correct. Uh, but be careful if there is any something called only or like that. You have to be careful. Which is not correct. The first one is not correct. I would say it's a medium uh, question. CDS is something which I think very, very um, uh, many of you are already aware of. Theatrization, you may not have heard of uh, heard of that, but uh, if you if you are following the current affairs regularly, theatrization comes very much in the news specif uh, specifically uh, with respect to India's preparation for any kind of uh, threat if uh, India is going to face uh, as a two war front from China from China and Pakistan. If there is any kind of two front war in India or maybe three front three front war in some case then yes theatrization is very much in the news with respect to the uh, defense capabilities of India. So right now the answer uh, is A and uh, I think uh, this is quite medium uh, kind of level. You can risk it, you can go for it without any problem. All you have to be is little bit more careful with these kind of concepts. Okay, now the question number 42 was with respect to 
जियो स्पेशियल आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस एंड द रैंडम फॉरेस्ट्री टेक्नोलॉजी एंड यू आर सपोज टू टेल यू नो विच ऑफ द स्टेटमेंट इज वेरी क्लोजली एसोसिएटेड विद दीज टू टेक्नोलॉजी नाउ दिस इज अ वेरी टफ क्वेश्चन वाई बिकॉज इफ यू आर नॉट अवेयर ऑफ द टेक्नोलॉजी यू विल नॉट बी एबल टू सॉल्व इट फर्स्ट लेट्स लर्न अबाउट दीज टेक्नोलॉजीज वॉट एग्जैक्टली दे आर एंड देन विल गेट बैक टू द क्वेश्चन वंस अगेन सो एज द क्वेश्चन वॉज आस्किंग अबाउट द जियो स्पेशियल आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस बेसिकली it is the national institute of advanced sciences bengaluru that has launched this pilot project of geo ai and this particular project is also along with the random forestry technology now two technologies are important this geo spatial artificial intelligence is basically the integration of the artificial intelligence along with other technologies like geo spatial data science and tech wagera that is how the integration is going to be done what exactly this technology is about it is it can it can actually use a simple smartphone app you can use that particular app providing real time feedback about the surroundings traffic conditions and every single thing around you just by uh, utilizing this particular technology okay so this technology makes the smartphone as if a real time feedback interactive platform for you guys same you have the random forest technology this technology is again very very important now this technology is based on the machine learning algorithms the first one clearly based on artificial intelligence random forest is a ml algorithm machine learning algorithm it basically use multiple decision trees to make predictions or the classification about a problem this is a machine learning tool now researchers in our country they have used they are using these two technologies for for the purpose of air quality monitoring in india now this is very hard to guess but yes right now these two technologies are used for air quality monitoring in our country based on that we we have got our aqi air quality index i'm sure like every city has their own aqi so that air quality assessment of the aqi is done based on these two technologies so if you go back to the question it was a tough one i would say uh, you should not you should not take any risk because these are very specific questions if you have no idea please skip it the right answer has to be a uh, sorry the right answer has to be b in this particular uh, sorry uh, a b c yeah d has to be the right answer it is not about the covid it is not about conserving biodiversity not about preventing cyber attacks it is about predicting the quality air quality of that particular area right so d has to be the right answer in this case moving on with the next question uh, question number 43 now this question talks about this particular question talks about the meta genome sequencing i am sure you have heard this word as genome sequencing genome is something which is very very common word genome has its relation with the genes genes are basically the storehouse of the information that we have if we all have our genetics the genes the storehouse of our each and every information about our body about our ancestry everything we have is based in that genes genome sequencing and meta genome sequencing are two different things the question here now bear i'm not asking about genome this question specifically talk about the meta genome sequencing it's a process of determining what so you need to be aware of this uh, uh, process first you need to be very much comfortable about the rna dna these are now again this question is i would say it's a tough question because you are going to deal with the information which is very specific there is absolutely no scope of any logic or something because this is fact based questions first let me explain you what is a genome sequencing in a very simple language so we all like every organism is made up of a genome genome is basically the set of genes that an organism has genome sequencing is simply a process of determining the complete dna sequence of an organism like if if uh, we are humans so genome sequencing means decoding and knowing about the genes of humans each and every gene is to be set is to be studied separately and we are going to know the functions when i say the meaning of genome sequencing i am going to study the function of each gene it is about studying each gene uh, knowing about its function and getting every information about it that is the meaning of genome sequencing the question was about the meta genome meta genome is actually one of the subset genome sequencing is about complete dna sequence but meta genome is not complete dna sequence it is only about uh, determining the dna sequence of the sample microorganism that you are dealing 
So, it, it will take care of that one particular sample that is under the study. The genome sequencing is about the complete set of the DNA. Now, if you look at look at look back to the statement once, I want you guys to focus one by one. Look at the statement. Here it says the meta genome is about determining the complete DNA profile. No, it is not. If it is complete, it has to be genome sequencing, not the meta genome. Meta genome is one of it. So, first clearly is not correct. If you know this much, you could have eliminated the first and the last one. Now, only choice you have is between B and C. Now, what else you need to know about it? Let's first understand that. Now, here guys, be very careful. Whenever we are talking about a genome, a genome means a complete set of the genetic information that we have. And that genetic information can be in both ways. It can be in the form of a DNA or in the form of an RNA, where DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA is simply ribonucleic acid. Most of the organisms have DNA genomes, but there are some viruses which also have their genetic information in the RNA. Best example is the virus. Mostly virus are RNA coded viruses. Okay. And these genomes determine everything, your function, your development, evolution, every history of, of that organism is within that RNA and DNA. Now you would say, sir, RNA DNA has some similarities, but they also have a lot of dissimilarities. See, both RNA and DNA, both are made up of nucleic acids. Both are capable of storing and transmitting the genetic information. That is something we have already learned. But there is a difference. The ribonucleic acid RNA, as the name must get you clear, it is based or it, it carries that ribose sugar. That is its principal nucleic acid. Both are nucleic acids, but RNA's principal nucleic acid is ribose sugar. Whereas in case of DNA, it is deoxyribose sugar. It is basically a kind of nucleic acid which is which is able to store and transmit the genetic information. And second thing is, thing is RNA is a single stranded structure. But whereas the DNA is a double stranded structure, you, you must have seen these kind of structures, no? So this, this is a double stranded structure which is a DNA. And RNA is always a single stranded structure. That is again some basic uh, difference between the two. But overall, both are in a position to store the information. Now, going back to the question, if you see, now it says the first statement being wrong. We have already uh, understood that. Second is correct. It's a genome set of the complete gene encoded RNA, DNA. Yes, they both are nucleic acid store information. But yes, there is a difference and that we have. So always be careful. RNA is ribose and single uh, structure. DNA is deoxy and double structure. So yeah, and I think this is easy to understand also, no? D, D for DNA, D for deoxy and D for double. So if you remember the D word as a common link, so I think the question will not get wrong. Um, I would say it's a medium level question. You must risk it because see, you may not be aware. I know this particular statement was a tough one, but look at these two statements. This is something you have read at your school level. No, we, we, we have this information about the RNA, DNA. Even if you are not able to get the first one right, at least you have two, th two third information. You can risk this, this kind of question without any doubt, without any issue. Now going back, uh, going back to the next question, we have the question 44. Again, this question is based on the virus, DNA, RNA, very important. So this question, what, what you are supposed to be careful about? One, you should have at least good information about the viruses. Virus is a very important uh, concept these days. So you have to have a basic uh, information about the virus. And then very, very important test. I'm sure we all have gone through the RT-PCR test. You know, during the COVID time, everybody was talking about the RT-PCR PCR is mandatory. You should go with the RT-PCR test. It was very much in the news always, right? But now, if you are serious about the RT-PCR, have you learned something about it? Very technical, but something we have, we must learn. Specifically post-COVID, do expect these kind of questions because RT-PCR was a test that we all have conducted. Now, UPSC will want you to know if you were, if you were curious enough to learn about the test, which everyone, everyone was going about, right? Now, let's, let's learn about these two tests first, and then we'll get back to the question. Some important information you have to learn about the viruses. Always remember, guys, whenever you talk about the virus, virus is a very, very special organism. Why very special? Virus is half living, half dead. When I say half living, half dead, why? It is, it is also called as non-truly living. I'll tell you why. Virus is something which is dead outside the host. Viruses are always dependent on their host. 
to live they have to enter uh, enter into the host then only they become alive otherwise outside the host if they are they are always dead that is the special category of the viruses so that is why they are sometimes they are living non living or sometimes called the non not true living organisms viruses are always going to search for the host for their survival they can reproduce only within a living cell that's why they, they are dependent on their host and that is one of the reasons why viruses always spread so fast because viruses always need to change their host for their own survival they are a true parasite in this particular sense right now always one thing you need to be aware of now why there are no uh, not much antiviral uh, medicines like we have antibiotics but you do not have many of the antiviral drugs why it is very difficult to deal with the viruses why virus is that microscopic infectious agent which actually is made up of rna dna most of them are made up made up of rna now viruses has the virus has a very special coating on its outer layer and this special this is a protein layer coating every virus has this special protein coat which is called the capsid this layer is called the capsid layer and this capsid layer protect the viruses from any further attack by any medicine also help them to get to get attach to any of the host the capsid is the most important part it helps virus survive any attack it also help them find the host get stuck to the host and and uh, you must have seen the spike proteins on a on a virus well those spike proteins are also on this particular capsid layer that is a very special uh, thing you need to know about the viruses now second talking about the pcr and rt pcr now if you look at the pcr method it is to amplify detect the dna sequences only but the rt pcr test that you and me were doing during the covid times it is basically rt pcr is a method where i am going to convert the rna into dna because see the covid virus that we all were fighting covid was a rna based uh, uh, you know virus so basically this rt pcr convert the rna into the dna and then we are able to find out we are able to locate detect if there is any virus inside us or not with every rt pcr test that we we were doing we were basically trying to detect that rna converted dna into our blood into our body and that is how it works now if you go back to the question what the question was asking is about both these topics and both statements are very much uh, right i i mean no i uh, totally understand it's a tough question if you have absolutely no idea then skip it because because in these technical kind of questions upsc will always trick you upsc will always have something some some modification uh, that they will do if you have learn about them then only you can attempt otherwise it's a tough question don't risk it for for no reason otherwise you will end up doing the negative marking more question number 45 is again a very uh, important uh, topic with respect to the cyber attacks whenever you talk about the cyber attacks there are many types of cyber attacks that we have the four of them were mentioned phishing smishing malware and spoofing so now you are supposed to tell me the definition about these cyber attacks these are different different types of cyber attacks when you talk about the phishing phishing is what phishing is a cyber attack method yes uh, uh, it's a cyber attack where we uh, where the attacker send deceptive emails or messages to the victims many times you get very random anonymous messages and very random anonymous emails where they want you to click that at this you know you you must have got this info uh, messages like okay uh, congratulations you have won a 25 lakh loan uh, you know to collect and claim this uh, uh, prize please click on this link below these are deceptive emails and messages right so basically this is this is the way phishing is done and if you by chance click on those links or you go to their websites they are going to steal your personal and financial information that is called phishing now in in case of the smishing it is it is a type of phishing only but this this smishing is actually when when specifically only sms or the text messages are used not the emails so smishing is a part of uh, phishing only so clearly this second statement looks wrong here it is this it belongs the second statement it has to be this one when you view you you, uh, you get the sms text messages and uh, uh, that messages want you to download some apps or it they will redirect you to some fraudulent website or something like that 
and then we have the malware see malware is a very general term any software any software that is designed to harm or disrupt or steal your data from the computer that is a malware malware is, is something that will do the malfunction to your computer network or, or a device so look second and third are basically inter exchange in the question fourth is fine fourth is okay spoofing is a technique of uh, discussing disguising the identity or the origin of the communication and it is it is mostly done so that the attacker is going to hide their own identity and it will make it appear as a, some different authentic sources there it's it's a way to trick the uh, people uh, again by where the attacker always disguise as something else if today i am going to get a, a, an email from let's say it says uh, the this email is uh, from the my government app so they will use my government app as a fraud uh, entity and they are going to trick me so when you are hiding your original source and communication that is a case of spoofing so i think in this case uh, it 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 was a if it was a tough one but i think there are uh, like these words like phishing words like malware are quite uh, normal they are not very hardcore topics you may have a problem with the uh, uh, smoofing and smishing but i think uh, you should risk it at least you know two three of the uh, terms here the two pairs are correct and two pairs are incorrect okay now going back to the next question that is question number 46 now this question is again has to do something with the cyber security now you see why we are asking so many questions on cyber security because it is one of the burning and hot topics of the upsc and it is going to be asked in some way or the other now the question has some important information the cyber security question was about the cert in i am sure you think of the cyber security in india the very first name that should come to your mind is indian computer emergency emergency response team it is the national nodal agency in, in our country where it, ha, it it is supposed to respond to every security threat which is there so for every cyber security threat of india if it is one nodal agency that is to be contacted it is the cert in so this looks quite okay with me now the second question was about the os maya this is an open source uh, operating system it is indigenous operating system made by the defense ministry of india yes it is it is it's a very uh, interesting concept what are open so, uh, open source softwares which can be customized and modified according to the requirements okay you must learn about the operating system maya it is open source ubuntu it is based on the open source ubuntu ubuntu is basically a free open source uh, operating si software which is linux based and used by computer or virtual server and for the first time this is indigenously operating system indian indians have made it our ourselves and this is this is made by the defense ministry of india so if let us say you have this question you must be aware of the o operating system maya the open source uh, network ubuntu defense ministry they are all very important and why and talking bit about the operating systems see operating system is what it is basically the software that manages all the functions of your computer right so right now what which operating system you are using are you using uh, the uh, apple services you using operating system as windows operating system so all these window uh, ios they are all operating systems that are taking care of the functions that you are going you are you guys have right so this is this is correct now the third statement was also right it is about the virtual private network the vpn is a very uh, very important technologies these days A lot of people use the VPN. It create a secure and encrypted connection. I mean, if you are using the VPN, it is very difficult to uh, you know en en uh, encroach into your security settings. Basically, if any user wants to protect their privacy and data, so people are using the virtual private network. It's 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 a kind of safety wall. It's a kind of uh, firewall where uh, uh, the attacker and ha hackers they cannot en uh, encroach into your system. It's a virtual private network. very much in demand they are always uh, uh, you know being asked here now the last question last statement is again very interesting it's about the cyber swachhta kendra like like we have the for the cyber security like we have the swachhta kendra for the normal the the physical clean cleanliness cyber swachhta is basically about the cyber cleanliness of our system cyber swachhta kendra is a botnet cleaning malware analysis center and it is the one that gives us solution how we can remove the malicious software from the devices so yeah and this this uh, swachhta kendra is actually set up under the cert in it is the cert in which set up all these cyber secure cyber swachhta kendra it's a tough one i would i i, I know it's a tough one uh, but um, if you have heard any of them 
you you have chance of eliminating them uh, at least at least uh, cyber security is something which is important topic i expect you guys to at least know about these two and the vpn this may be little bit difficult and factual one but uh, at least you know two three you can still risk it if you want otherwise i know it's a tough one uh, do not do not just randomly or blankly solve these kind of questions they are difficult the next question question number 47 was the kessler syndrome now kessler syndrome is something which is very much in the news right now kessler syndrome is something which you will find uh, in your syllabus specifically in terms of satellite communication satellite specifically in terms of uh, uh, space technologies what is a kessler syndrome so clearly the kessler syndrome is not at all about the nuclear chain reaction not at all about the solar flare not about the global warming or something well kessler syndrome has to do with the prediction of the space debris in the low earth orbit what basically there was a person uh, in nasa there was a scientist and his name was kessler look at the information important information so the person donald j kessler in 1978 he came up with a theory and his theory was that right now around the earth in the low earth orbit what is this lower earth orbit basically any orbit which is less than 2000 km 2000 km or less than 2000 km from the surface that is called the low earth orbit now there are so many satellites which are there in the low earth orbit and his prediction was there will be a time when these satellites are going to collide with each other or they are going to collide with other uh, you know objects and they are going to produce lots of debris lots of space debris these space debris will further collide with each other and at the end you are going to have this kind of mess around the earth where all the earth orbits are going to be disrupted by the chaos of the space debris now that is what is called the kessler syndrome it is still a theoretical concept but it is talking about how in future we we are going to have a problem with the space debris it's it's a it's a very important question and it's a common word in the space technologies if you are a, a, re, a regular uh, you know reader of current affairs this is an easy one very quite very easy very predictable you must attempt it uh, kessler is something that you should be aware of in space technologies it it makes sense next question we have is with respect to the space explore exploration initiatives now there are three important things in this particular question number 48 it is talking about the artemis accord it is talking about the lupix mission which is a joint mission of india japan yes and third very interesting point it talks about the chandrayaan 3 the chandrayaan 3 that recently we have successfully uh, completed the chandrayaan 3 mission where we have done the soft landing soft landing was done by our lander vikram the point the particular point where our chandrayaan 3 landed that particular point today is called as shiv shakti yes it is called the shiv shakti and the particular point where the last chandrayaan 2 crashed on the on the lunar surface that particular point is called tiranga so tiranga is the point where chandrayaan 2 crashed chandrayaan 3 landing site today is called shiv shakti the, the third is absolutely correct this is a pure fact based question if you know it you know it you do not know it don't attempt it because it's a tough one lupex mission if you're talking about lupex lupex stands for lunar exploration and it is a joint lunar exploration between india and japan specifically after the successful success of chandrayaan 3 india has got a bigger credibility in the space market now every country wants to collaborate with india with respect to the lunar uh, south pole because that is that is exactly where we are targeting in chandrayaan 3 we 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 were very we landed very close to the south pole not exactly south pole but in the southern hemisphere now we are specifically going to target that lunar south pole should be the uh, area of our landing where of course india and japan collaboratively doing it okay now the the second and third is okay fine quite fine then comes a very interesting and important accord which is called artemis accord now you need to know about it then only you will be you will be in a position to solve it what is this artemis accord guys artemis accord is basically set of the principles which ultimately govern the civil exploration and how the world is going to use the outer space outer space 
any planet, comet, moon, how the world will use it only for the peaceful purpose. I mean, there should not be militarization of the space so that the any no country should use the space as a as a uh, you know area of deploying any weapons of mass destruction. So Artemis Accord has very simple purpose that outer space to be used only and only for peaceful purposes. And this accord is actually based on the Outer Space Treaty 1967, which was about the peaceful use of the space. Now, this Artemis Accords, they were established by U United States of America and along with them are the some other founding member as well. There are seven founding members of these accords, Australia, Canada, Italy, Japan, Luxembourg, UAE and UK. And very recently, 2020 only, we got this Artemis Accords. Is India a member? Yes. India joined as the last one as 27th member. In total, there are 27 countries. India joined as the last 27th country. One thing you have to be careful about. These are Artemis Accord. US has one more similar accord called the Abraham Accords. Don't get confused. Abraham Accord is altogether different thing. It is about normalizing the relations of Israel with the Arab world. That is totally geopolitical, very different. This is Abraham Accord. Now, this question was about the Artemis Accord. So, two things are very same, looks very same. Both has a common point of United States of America, but don't get confused. So, here all the three are very much correct. Uh, a little bit of a technical question. I think it's a, it's a tough one, but if you have read it, then you can, you can attempt it. Otherwise, no clue, then you can take a risk, little bit of risk, but uh, be very careful because these are factual questions, not much scope of applying logic or elimination. Now, the question 49 was with respect to India's three stage nuclear power program. Now, this is a very, very important question, guys. Why do I, I'm calling it so important? Because nuclear power program, if you are preparing for the UPSC, you should be thoroughly aware about India's three stage nuclear power program. Why India has a three stage nuclear power program? Because in India, UV do not have the presence of uranium 235. And for, for many, many years, lot of the developed world were not interested in sharing technology of nuclear power with India. So India had to be self-dependent. India has to make, make its own three-stage nuclear program in which we have devised something very unique for ourselves. And today India is totally, thoroughly India is independent and we are able to pull out our nuclear program based on our own capabilities. It is purely Atmanirbhar Bharat kind of thing, right? Now, what exactly this three-stage nuclear program? If you are aware of it, then only the question can be solved. Otherwise, it, it is this, this question is going to go over up over your head. Now, please look how the three-stage nuclear program in India is done. See, basically, guys, you know the nuclear programs. You what which particular nuclear fuel is required? It is uranium-235. Uranium-235 is the isotope of uranium which is radioactive, but 99% uranium is present in the form of uranium 238 you do not only only 0.7 percent of this is the natural composition so basically uranium 235 needs to be enriched people and the countries they enrich there has to be enrichment of this uh, 238 so that we take it to the level of 235 enrichment means we are increasing the percentage of isotope u35 this is a normal case but with India, we, we had uh, devised our own way of doing it. Now for India's nuclear program, it was all started with the Homi uh, Jhangi Baba. Uh, he was the, he is the pioneer, he was the, he was the father of India's nuclear program. And how India can do it uh, with low uranium reserve profile. Now what he said that there will be three stages. In stage number one, what we will do, we are going to use a pressurized heavy water reactor. In this particular reactor, we are going to feed, normally we are going to feed the uh, natural uranium, U38 will be filled and along with will, will, uh, will this, this normal fuel, 238 is going to be filled. As a result of the reactions, what we will get from the stage number one is basically the plutonium because plutonium is 239. Now, if, when you get plutonium as the end product, this plutonium is to be used in stage number two. In stage number two, we are going to feed that uh, there will be fast breeder uh, reactor. What, are, what is a fast breeder reactor? Where it is going to produce more nuclear fuel than it is utilizing. So fast breeder in this fast breeder reactor, 
Now, what we are going to fill is plutonium along with some uranium, natural uranium and at some point we are also going to introduce some of the thorium. Now, as a result of this, what we are going to get is something very, very special. We are going to get the uranium 233 by the end of our stage 2. This is the end product. Now, we will take this end product and we will start our stage number 3 where along with U33, we are going to add lots and lots of thorium which India has abundance and this is going to be the fuel which will be utilized, which will be utilized for our self-sustaining nuclear power. So, the, the way India has designed it is something very, very unique. Okay? That, is, that is a three-stage program we are looking for and right now, India has recently, very recently, India has successfully commissioned our first prototype fast breeder reactor for the second stage that we have dis just discussed. And where India has recently uh, done that? It was, it is in Kalpakkam. Kalpakkam, India already has a nuclear power plant in Tamil Nadu. Okay? And this fast breeder reactor is going to be operated by Bhavini. Bhavini is basically Bharatiya uh, Navikya Vidyut Nigam Limited is responsible for this fast breeder reaction. Okay? Now, if you, if you look at the question once, uh, you will understand, I told you about the enrichment, I told you about everything. So, here, if you look at the three stage program, the first statement says, uranium enrichment process of increasing percentage, I told you, this is, this is because ultimately you need 235. This is the, this is the one where nuclear power is done. Third stage program consists of advanced heavy water reactor, yes. Third stage, we have just uh, told you, uh, thorium is used as a fuel uh, for the self-sustaining part, yes. So, how you can remember? It is T for the third and T for the thorium. Okay, So, T can be the common word you can remember. T for thorium, T for third stage fuel. And where in India we have? We have abundance of thorium reserves. In fact, in 2022, UPSC asked this question about monazite sand. In India, thorium reserves are there in the monazite sands of India, which is in the state of Kerala. There is abundance of thorium reserves that we have. Yes. And fourth, we have just told you that yes, India has successfully uh, commissioned the first prototype in Tamil Nadu, Kalpakkam. Okay? So, yes, it is a tough one. If you are not aware of it, then it becomes tough. If you have a little bit of information, you can still risk it. Uh, but if you have absolutely no clue, you are true beginner, then there is no option, but you have to skip it. Because you do not, you can't uh, go with all these information. I mean, I mean, there is no scope of doing it, right? I mean, first statement looks fine, second looks fine but you can't guess the, the other ones. That is, that is something you have to be careful about. Question number 50 was with respect to the superconductivity. So, the very important word is superconductivity. Now, think about it. What, what superconductivity can be? Normally, you know about the conductors, you know about the insulators. Superconductivity means something which is even better than a conductor, right? Something which is even better than a conductor. So, by this concept, Superconductivity, it is property of a certain material to conduct direct current electricity without energy loss when they are cooled down below a critical temperature. Superconductivity always going to require very, very low temperature, maybe in some minus degree Celsius. So, whenever you are going to make a conductor cool down before uh, below the critical temperatures, then it is going to have very excessive conductivity, there will be no energy loss and you can actually transmit energy in a more efficient manner. That is the superconductivity, right? So, at least this much we can solve with our, with our common sense and any statement not having one has to be eliminated. Now, look at the third one. Forget about the second one, look at the third one. If logically, if you think superconductivity is going to have high electric currents, fine, more conductivity. Now, where you would you need such kind of technology? Medical ranging, yes. We have the MRIs, MRI, we need to have this kind of flowless, uh, uh, less with minimum energy loss, we need to have this kind of magnetic levitation is again very much technology where superconductivity will be used. Magnetic levitation is what? Where the, where the trains are going to be running uh, on magnetic levitation. You are going to have two bigger magnets and without con uh, touching each other with zero friction, the, there will be super bullet trains. Magnetic levitation is, is that concept. Even in quantum computing, we use it. Yes. So, these two are okay, fine, makes sense. Now, the third one is going to make you a bit trouble. 
if you are not aware about the, about, the, about the Meissner effect, but for, for that matter you should know Meissner effect is associated with this conductive superconductivity, yes. So here the answer has to be D, but what exactly is Meissner effect is something you have to be careful about. But now since you have figured out the 2 out of the 3, I think being tough you can still risk it because you have just understood how to go with the first and third statement. Th second is of course a bit uh, technical. You then I'll explain you the Meissner effect. Meissner, what is the Meissner effect? Basically, Meissner effect is when there is expulsion of the magnetic field. A superconductor, whenever it is cooled down below the critical temperature, that superconductor always expels the magnetic field and does not allow magnetic field to penetrate inside it. Means it becomes a kind of uh, a conductor with absolutely no magnetic field. No magnetic field can penetrate inside it. This phenomenon of superconductors of expelling their magnetic field is called the Meissner effect. M for magnetic, M for Meissner effect. Clear? But every, every superconductor must show this kind of property. This is one of the properties that we expect from the superconductor. If you want to learn more about the superconductor, in the PDF there is a detailed explanation guys. The next question is with respect to the prehistoric megalith. The very first picture that should come to your mind whenever you think about megalith is large stones. Look, look at the word mega is large. The word lith, lith means rocks. Simply, megalith is large rocks. In India, megaliths are large stones used to construct prehistoric structures, moments either alone or with, the, with other stone. Yes. I am sure you have seen lot of big big stones uh, were used in India for every construction in the prehistoric times and we have got so many evidences in our archaeological records about it, right? So the first statement looks correct. Now second is going to give you a bit trouble, I know. First is still okay, very easy statement but second is something which is very tricky. Now second is very specifically asking you about the hat stones. Hat stone is called, called the, the Thopi Kallu. Thopi Kallu is, is, is these kind of stones where the stones have some kind of hat structure all over them. This is a typical hat stone in India. Now this is this hemispherical laterite stones used as a lid on the burial urns. Burial urns, the locations where the, where the people were buried after their, their death. Now it says that these kind of structures mainly you will find in Telangana. Are they in Telangana? Now you have to be very specific. In Telangana we have megalith but we do not have hat kind of stones. These are very unique stones that you will find in Kerala, not in Telangana. So this second statement, you really cannot do anything about it. It's a pure fact based question. If you still want to take a risk, you can take a risk if at least if you are aware of one particular statement. But again, but again, these are very typical one. I do not I will not suggest you to take any kind of risk because some uh, statements can be uh, you know understood with logic. Second, second statement is very, very uh, typical statement with a fact based thing, right? <clears throat> so now you have, you have just understood about the megaliths. They were very common in India during the Iron Age, I mean like 1500 to 500 BC. Very, very common megaliths were there. You, you can look at the shapes, various and this is the topical that we are talking about. These are the specific hard stones that we are talking about. Even today in India, even today the people, uh, people the Gond tribe of India, the Khasis people in Meghalaya, even they still use these, uh, these kind of megaliths. In India, we have some of the tribes are even utilizing them. The Gonds in the central India and the Khasis in uh, Meghalaya, they still uh, are very much using these megaliths. So we have, we have this cultural uh, part intact and uh, we told you that this belongs to Kerala, very important. In India, there are other many, many sites of megalith. In India, like the Maharashtra has many, many uh, megalith sites, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Andhra, Telangana. But this type, this specific hat type is related to Tel uh, Kerala, not the Telangana. Okay, so be, be a bit more careful about it. Okay, gee. now the next question is the question number 52. This question is about the Hangul and you are supposed to tell me that uh, in which particular area Hanguls are likely to be found. Okay. What is the other name of Hangul? If you have read about the biodiversity of India, Hangul's other name is, is called the Kashmir stag. Its other name is called Kashmir stag. It is a, it is a subspecies of the red deer, we know that. 
and also this Kashmir stag is a state animal of Kashmir. It is also the state animal of the Kashmir. By only by this information, I can solve this particular question. Because if there is anything called as Kashmir stag, it has to be in Jammu and Kashmir. Where do we have Kana National Park? Madhya Pradesh. Manas is belongs to the state of Assam. Namdafa belongs to Arunachal Pradesh. Only option left with is Dachigam. Dachigam National Park is in Jammu and Kashmir and there we will have the Hangul. Simple, looks difficult, don't lose your calm, understand, think about the other alternative names. Sometime name has itself the answer. So I think this is a medium one and we can attempt it if you know the locations of these national parks and it is a it is a very important thing you must you must be aware of important national parks along with the states for that matter please do the map practice it's it is utmost important for you to do the map practice with respect to the major uh, uh, national parks of india wildlife sanctuaries biosphere reserves map marking is must and look at the trend of the upsc last four or five years map marking questions are very very prominent in the paper so do take care of them talking about the hangul um, it is the only asiatic survivor subspecies that we have today uh, and um, yes the critical the its iucn status is critically endangered you should be aware of the iucn status they are important they are preserved under sites one uh, sites appendix one uh, right now they are restricted to the state of jammu and kashmir and to be very frank, they are restricted to the uh, Dachingham National Park. But there was a time when Hangul used to be found other than Kashmir. They were also there in Himachal Pradesh Chamba district. But now you do not find them in there. But they are, and that is why they are critically endangered. Okay, important guys. Okay, next one, the next question we have. And here, here are the important uh, national parks. Specifically, if you talk about Jammu Kashmir, Jammu Kashmir has four important national parks. This is the Salim Ali National Park that you have. Dachingham, right, right uh, next to Salim Ali, we have Dachingham. And then you have in the in the Ladakh area, you have the Hemis National Park. And then the Kishtwar is also there in Jammu part, guys. So three in Jammu, basically, these three are in Jammu. Uh, Salim Ali, Dachingham and Kishtwar in Jammu. And Hemis is the one we have in Ladakh. Very, very important. Okay, Hemis National Park. Question 53 is about... International Whaling Commission, very much in news, important. International Whaling Commission, is it a UN specified agency? No, it is not a UN specified agency. Okay, and uh, second statement says that it has issued first ever extinction alert about the dugong. Never ever about dugong, nothing, nothing is uh, being issued by the Whaling Commission. First of all, you need to know what an International Whaling Commission is. As the name suggests, it has to do something with the whale, no? As the name says, it has something to do with the whale, basically about, you know, uh, preserving, protecting the whales, catching, uh, setting the catch limits only, okay, this much, this much uh, whale can be, uh, uh, can be trapped. So, it is about conserving, protecting the whales around the world and also about designated areas at the whale centuries because whale ultimately is called uh, uh, you know rich resource that we have a whale in itself is having many many resources so because there was a time when very very indiscriminate hunting of the whales used to happen so 1946 international whaling commission was established it is an intergovernmental organization clearly not a united nation organization it is all about to regulate the whaling catching the whales, conserving the whale stock. 88 members in total headquarters are in United Kingdom and it set the limit. Okay, only this much whales you are going to, you are going to catch, not more than that. Plus, it also conducts scientific research about the whale populations and their ecology. And very, very important guys, very important since 1982, the International Whaling Commission has imposed a moratorium on commercial whaling means Right now in the world, there is absolutely nowhere where you are going to have commercial whaling. There are few exceptions like Norway and Iceland. These are the exceptions. I mean, people here still hunt the whale for the commercial purpose. But other than these two, 
there is a moratorium there is a ban there is a delay there is a ban temporary ban on commercial fishing since 1982 with respect to the wheels it is it is this much important guys and second statement was wrong because see this commission has definitely issued a warning but that was not about the dugong that was about the critically endangered vequita porpoise that is different species than than the gugong right so two things are very different it is it is a relative to the dolphin but uh, it is not the dugong dugong is different and why this vequita porpoise was uh, considered to be uh, uh, you know it was a extinction alert because this lives only in Gulf of Mexico, Gulf of California and Mexico and right now it's their population is continuously declining and that is why it was very much in the news. So this question, I know it's a, it's not a very unconventional kind of topic but if you know the facts, you can attempt it, you can do that but otherwise it's a bit risky. So only attempt when you have something solid to remember here. Question number 54 was there and 54 number question is about Okay, which of the following items have, have got the GI uh, tags? This is very important topic in general. So be very careful about the GI tags, wh where we are, uh, you know, which latest, every time any latest uh, product get the GI tag, it becomes important. What is a GI tag? See guys, uh, like if I if I'll tell you, okay, fine. This is the basmati rice. If you are going to go the, if you want to buy the bice, uh, rice in the market, so there are normal, there is a normal rice you can buy or you are going to buy the basmati rice. Why would you prefer basmati rice? Because there is a brand name about, about that rice. When you are, you are, when you are uh, buying that particular basmati rice, there is a value attached to it. You are very sure about the quality of that product. Okay, this is, this is going to be good because it is a basmati rice, right? GI tag is given to these kind of products be it agriculture product or it can be any traditional handicraft or any kind of product which has which has something to do with the location like for example if i if i if i if i want to have the best tea of the world i'll say sir the best tea you have to have the darjeeling tea no so any item any uh, uh, you know any particular item having a, uh, having the value associated with its original place and that gives its authenticity of that particular place for that matter for the preservation of that for the conservation of that value we give that particular product a GI status. In India Darjeeling tea was the first product in 2004 that has got the first GI tag of India. Even the Chokua rice very recently has got a GI tag it belongs to the state of Assam. Hyderabad biryani has not yet received GI status. Then of course these Matti banana varieties, they also have got the GI status, they are also called the baby bananas, very very good as a baby food they are utilized. So here the answer has to be C. Now you will say sir how we can figure out, no you cannot do any guesswork, this is 100% fact based. So for that matter you have to be updated which products are getting the GI tags, at least the special one you can, you can think of, it's a tough one, skip it if you have no idea, do not make any blunder because purely fact based question it is. So here, here we have we have specified in our PDF all the important uh, GI tags which are there and uh, which particular GI tag belongs to which, which particular state. So there is a list also and at least these are the these are some of the important GI tags very recent one. You can't remember every tag but at least try to remember the recent ones for example these particular rice that we have got and there are other metal crafts. Hai na? Goa uh, mangoes are were very much in the news. So everything, at least these new products, you have to be care, uh, take care of. Uh, you have to remember them. Uh, they, they are available in the PDF. Try to remember them. That's the only way you can do it. Okay. Now the question number fifty-five was was with respect to the Bright Star twenty-three. Now this is a particular exercise. It's a biennial multilateral tri service exercise. Biennial means every two years. It's a tri service means the army, navy, air force is going to take the part. But which country leads the bright star 23? It is clearly not India. I mean of course many of us must have attempted India as the answer but India is not the answer. So please remove India here. Bright star belongs to USA and Egypt. Bright star is USA and Egypt. Well this was in news recently because for the first time India participated in this particular uh, exercise that is why it becomes important otherwise um, 
I mean, of course, 90% of us will definitely go with, I am sure many of you have attempted D as the answer, but a bright star has to do with US and Canada, uh, US and Egypt. Tough, don't risk, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a risky question. If you are total alien to this kind of name, don't risk it. What exactly this bright star is all about? It was started way back in 1980 in Egypt. Okay, and this particular tri-service joint military exercise, 34 countries participate, uh, participated recently with India being participating for the first time here. This is one of the largest ever joint military exercise in Middle East and North African region and that is why it was in the news with 34 member countries taking participate. But this, this uh, uh, bright star 23, now you have this, these two uh, countries leading it which is US and Egypt army. Of course, US has a lot of strategic interest in Africa. That's why these kind of things are there. Talking about the Africa, the, uh, talking about uh, the Africa, now we are going to South America. The question is about the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization called ACTO. Now, this, this is important. Why this is important? Because recently in the last two years, you must have heard a lot of news coming with respect to the Amazon forest, Amazon basin, right? And that is where the, this particular convention becomes important. Why? Because recently there is a Balaam declaration that has took place. Now, what is Balaam declaration? It has to do something with ACTO. I, I'll tell you a little later. But now, first of all, try to learn about it. What is this Amazon cooperation treaty organization? One thing is clear. If it is talking about the Amazon, it must, it must have to do something with South America. So basically this ACTO is intergovernmental organization of the eight Amazon countries. These, uh, these are the Amazon uh, uh, area and these countries belong to Amazon forest, right? Amazon forest, the, the largest tropical rainforest of the world. So these eight countries who are member of the Amazon cooperation treaty are Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Guana, Peru, Suriname and Venezuela. You can look at the map. Very important question. You may have this question as a map based question as well okay now this particular acto was signed way back in 1995 the the reason for creating it was just to implement the amazon cooperation treaty and it is talking about socio environment it is the only socio environmental block of latin america so it means a lot for the people of south america it is the only organization that talk about the socio environment issues in south america the main objective of ACTO is about the sustainable development all for all the uh, countries of the Amazon basin. Now recently it was in news because of the Belam declaration. Belam is basically a city, uh, Belam is a city uh, in Brazil, okay, Belam. And their Belam declaration was recently released by, these, by this particular group. Belam declaration also you, you may have a MCQ. Belam Declaration is about recognizing the rights of indigenous people. How we are going to include the indigenous people when it comes to biodiversity conservation. So this declaration underlined that there is a need to protect the land rights of these people. If you, if you really want to conserve the Amazon basin, then contribution by indigenous people is absolutely mandatory. That is the Belam Declaration. So you may have a question on ACTO, but at the same time, do read about Belam Declaration. You may have a question on that too. That is important. Amazons are called the lungs of the forest. Yes, we know Amazon are the world largest rainforest. They are responsible for 20% world oxygen and 10% world carbon dioxide they absorb. So they are one of the largest carbon sink. They are also one of the largest producers of the oxygen on this planet Earth. Along with that, they also are home to 10% of the world known species of plant and animals and they host many, many indigenous people and cultures and that is why the Belam Declaration becomes so relevant for this particular region. I hope that is clear to everyone. And if you look at the question, both statements, very straightforward questions, nothing, nothing much in there. I think there is no trouble with the second. I mean, this for this, we have, we have heard it, we know it already, Amazon is the lung of the earth. First also, you can go, you can understand, yes, okay, Amazon uh, uh, treaty is there. For which particular purpose? Of course, it is going to be about uh, the sustainable development of the Amazon basin. I think this is a very easy one. The name itself says a lot. You should attempt this kind of question. Don't skip it. It's a must attempt. Very simple marks giving questions, I would say. 
the next question is about the Kaziranga National Park. Now tell me first what picture comes to your mind when you think of the Kaziranga National Park. Kaziranga National Park is in Assam. Okay. So what first the very first picture that comes to our mind is the single horn rhinoceros. Right. I know you have the one horn rhinoceros. So one horn rhino is something that first picture comes to when we, we think of the Kaziranga. Now you have to tell me which particular feature best describes the Kaziranga. Now you see in this in this entire question, the nowhere, nowhere it is mentioned about the one because it is very obvious. So clearly this is not our savior and nowhere it is mentioned. So then you have to start looking for the other thing. Now, now start eliminating in this kind of questions. I probably the elimination will help you a lot so that last few lines, few options you can choose in a best possible manner. First think about the Kaziranga. Now I told you it is in Assam. Tell me guys, is it any chance that in Assam you are going to have tropical moist evergreen and alpine deciduous forest as its vegetation? No, I am not going to agree that in state of Assam, how can we have these kind of vegetations? There is some problem with the vegetation, right? And what exactly is the problem with the vegetation? Look, for, for, a, for a climatic weather of Assam, we are going to have alluvial grasslands, savanna woodlands, tropical moist deciduous and then we have a semi evergreen forest. We are not going to have evergreen forest over there. So that, that particular line at least helped me out to eliminate the statement number 4. Now what I am left with is, this is wrong. Now it says it is the only park in India where 4 different species of the big cats are found. Well this Kaziranga does not have this particular privilege. The only park in India where you are going to find, find leopard, snow leopard, tiger and clouded leopard, they call the four big cats, they belong to Nam Dafa. They belong to the Nam Dafa National Park. It is in Arunachal. In Kaziranga, you do not have the, these four big cats. You have the tiger, you do not have these four, uh, three other varieties as a big cat. Okay, So this is also not the case. Now the, the second statement is actually correct. Kaziranga, many very less number of people know. But Kaziranga actually has the largest population of the Asiatic wild buffaloes. 95% of them belongs in the state of Assam. In the world, there are approximately 3400, 2600 of them belongs to, to the Kaziranga National Park. And this park, now, now from now onwards, uh, along with imagining the uh, one horned rhino, you should also be remembering Kaziranga as a home of Asiatic wild buffaloes and first it clearly I can eliminate now I just told you it is it is in Assam right so is Assam a part of Western Himalayas I mean this is a pure geographical uh, uh, error right it belongs to the Eastern Himalayan biodiversity it is not the Western one Western Himalayas means Jammu Kashmir uh, Uttarakhand Himachal Pradesh right so simple in these methods where you have directly four statement without any combination no always go with the elimination and try to eliminate the most obvious one first. So now that way I have got the answer. I think it's a tough one uh, I, I, I can say but I will surely attempt it. I will surely risk it because at least by eliminating I am able to solve to eliminate two or three statements. Okay, Important very very important guys uh, with respect to this particular question. Now one thing I would like to specify. Though in Kaziranga we do not have a, that big four varieties that belongs to Nam Dafa, but always remember that in Kaziranga there is something called as big five. In Kaziranga there is something called as big five. Big five of Kaziranga means the five bigger you know uh, animals, one horned rhinoceros, royal Bengal tiger, Asiatic elephant wild water buffalo and swamp deer these five together are called the big five so this is this also becomes very important so clearly this big four cat is different now big five of kaziranga collectively has these five so one rhino tiger elephant buffalo and the swamp deer and and just to give you something very interesting if you look look at these animals and you, you read about the, uh, the Pashupati in, in your history, have you read about the Pashupati seal in uh, you know while talking about the Pashupati seal which particular animals were there? There was a rhino, there was a tiger, elephant, buffalo right. 
bull was there basically and the deer i mean these these uh, all these animals were also there in pashupati seal which 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 actually represents a yogi probably the proto shiva so pashupati seal also has this combination so there, this uh, if you if you remember the seal that it may be a good hint for you to remember these big five of the kaziranga right this is also important Lo uh, uh, looking at the uh, location the here you have the kaziranga national park in assam okay important and it it is my suggestion guys uh, do prepare the national parks and the biosphere reserves and the elephant park and the uh, tiger uh, reserves of the northeastern states northeastern states you should be very comfortable with the map so do practice all these on the northeastern map because upsc is always going to ask you questions with respect to northeast area the next question is with respect to the tampara lake this is again very very interesting question tampara lake where is where where you have a tampara lake well tampara lake belongs to which particular state you should be aware of that first let's see the location look at the location of the tampara lake uh, if you look at tampara you will see okay sir this particular belongs to uh, this particular belongs to the state of odisha tampara is in odisha right now look in odisha you have a tampara lake here please remember that tampara lake is a ramsar site in india but it has absolutely no connection with the mahanadi river dekho where is mahanadi look at this mahanadi river now this is your mahanadi clearly way far away from the lake you have to be comfortable with these uh, ramsar sites how many ramsar sites do we have we have the total 80 ramsar sites as of now february 2024 india has 80 ramsar sites ramsar sites are those wetlands which are of international importance okay now if you look at the Tam, uh, tampara lake and look at the question as it was saying this is a ramsar site yes does it is, is it connected to the mahanadi no it is quite far away rather tampara lake is actually connected to the rushikulya lake there is another another uh, river which is which is nearby so look if you look at the map again uh, tampara has a connection with the rushikulya uh, river and thus it helps in the flood control in that particular area but mahanadi is quite far away from this and the second statement about the tampara is again very very important question it says this is a fresh water lake now always be careful whenever there is any question about the lake be very careful upsc will trick trick you by replacing fresh water with the saline water or the vice versa so very careful which state which lake is fresh which is uh, saline lake this this something you have to be careful about so but tampara as far as tampara is concerned it is a fresh water lake formed as a result of historical battle during the colonial struggle now this is this is something new but it is true guys tampara lake has a very interesting history there was a battle between uh, the britishers and the french and in that battle they were they were uh, you know throwing lot of artillery over each other and during that particular time because uh, because of the battle uh, the explosives that were used in that battle actually created a very large depression later on that that depression was filled by water and today we call that as a tampara lake so it is a result of the historical battle between british and the french colonies specifically in the ganjam district of odisha important interesting but again this kind of question if you are not sure a uh, bit risky bit difficult you need to have good knowledge of the maps don't risk it it's a tough question risk only if you have no choice but to you know just do it for the sake of securing your upsc rank now next one question 58 uh, 59 a uh, very favorite question of the upsc statement statement 1 statement 2 statement 1 says ramsar convention international treaty for conservation sustainable use of the wetland yes it is we all are very very aware of the ramsar uh, convention and it says it's it's a convention was signed 1971 in iranian city of ramsar which is also the name of the convention i think dekho this is probably the most easy question of this of these uh, 20 tests right so yes statement is 1 and 2 both are right and we have read about ramsar convention n number of times so every wetland of international importance is going to be preserved under ramsar site now but i have something extra to tell you in india right now we have eight, uh, we have uh, uh, 80 ramsar sites there were 75 five recently we have added but please remember one thing the answer this is a very easy and uh, very easily uh, question 
remember in the world in the world there are many ramsar sites which country has the maximum number of ramsar site can be asked so think beyond what is asked in this particular test series okay so just to give you a little bit information in in general it is united kingdom having 175 ramsar sites in total in india right now the number is 80 okay india is at uh, is at number 80 okay uh, one thing the definition is very important always we always follow the definition of a wetland what is a wetland the definition is also specified in the ramsar convention wetland always means any marsh fresh peatland water can be natural can be artificial can be permanent can be temporary can be fresh can be brackish can be static can be flowing but there is condition the depth has to be less than 6 meter the depth of the wetland must be less than 6 meter that is one condition to get specified as a ramsar site and this convention is always about uh, propagating and telling people that we should always use this wetland very judiciously very wisely and how we should conserve it okay that is important now to talk about the ramsar conventions and the uh, ramsar sites it is again a very favorite topic of upsc upsc will ask you about the ramsar sites but not all the 80 sites but at least you should be aware of the latest five sites now which are the latest five sites at least keep a track on the latest sites now on the on the map it is clearly you can see very clearly we have mentioned about the sites the five latest sites added on this uh, uh, this second of february because every year second february is celebrated as international wetland day we celebrate it as a wetland day internationally so these are the fives we have the ash the uh, ashka nashini estuary we have the magadi we have the longwood shola reserve uh, forest we have the karaiveti and we have the uh, anka samudra these are the latest five so at least try to remember their name after this particular edition in india which particular state has the largest number of ramsar site it is tamil nadu guys in india tamil nadu has 16 ramsar sites followed by up which is having the 10 ramsar sites now you should also be good with these kind of facts upsc can ask you because uh, it is about because every year ramsar sites are being increased right now that takes us to the last question question number 60 again very factual question very fact based the question is about which lake is the world's highest commercially navigable lake just stick it to your heart world's commercially navigable lake is lake titicaca which is at the border of bolivia and peru look at this look at this on the map the answer has to be c guys this is world's commercially highest commercially navigable lake this lake titicaca is at a height of 3812 meter look at this look at this this is this is at the border peru and bolivia's border you have the lake titicaca This is the second largest lake of the South America after Lake Maracaibo. Maracaibo belongs to Venezuela. It is a brackish water lake. Uh, lake Titicaca is a fresh water lake. Lake Maracaibo is famous for its crude oil production. It is it is crude oil production and uh, uh, natural gas also in Maracay Lake Maracaibo. Okay, but uh, this particular one, the Lake Titicaca, uh, it is for the navigable purposes. very very important guys so that is all from my side uh, in this particular one i think this is okay very fact based question last one so that is all from our side i hope you have enjoyed uh, the part number 3 so i am going to see you in the next video with the next uh, set of 20 questions and to give you bit more knowledge about your upsc preparation if you have any doubt any queries we are always available for you so uh, uh, just all my best wishes hope you have enjoyed learn from this video Signing off Ashish Malik see you guys in the next video and all the best for UPSC exam